Hello, Recapped Mystery here. Today, I'm going to explain a thriller film, Escape from Pretoria. Watch out and take care. Apartheid was a system of institutionalized racial inequality that prevailed in South Africa from apartheid to apartheid, 1948. After a lengthy period of hardship, the black population began rioting to demand their rights and created the African National Party, or ANP. Tim comes down the street with two large bags, one of which he places in a dumpster and motions to his companion Stephen, who picks up a bag and deposits it near some automobiles. Tim drops his second bag near another garbage pile and connects the wires to the device. As he walks away hesitantly, a tiny explosion happens, scattering leaflets. They support apartheid by propagating the message that freedom and equality for all races must be fought for at all costs. Tim and Stephen try to flee the scene, but they are discovered and captured. Tim's girlfriend sneaks into his room and gives him some money while they are being prosecuted. She encourages him to keep going. Tim hides the money in a cigar case and hides it where the sun doesn't shine in the lavatory before the court hearing. 1978, the judge compliments the prosecution in court for presenting an overwhelming quantity of evidence of 26 custom-made bombs. As an excuse for their behavior, they claim that all races are equal, which is not widely received. The sentence is read aloud by the judge. Tim is sentenced to 12 years in prison as the primary bomb maker, and Stephen is sentenced to 8 years as an accomplice. As they prepare to leave the courthouse, Stephen spots an opportunity to escape through an open window and takes it, but in vain. He is beaten up when he reaches the ground. They are carried to Pretoria's prison, where the warden, Captain Schnappel, meets them with hatred because he deems them traitors. He delivers them over to Menier, a harsh prison officer. Tim gets a close look at the automatic grill doors, various barred gates, and security systems in place as they follow Menier, who explains the rules and regulations of the prison. Menier takes them to their cells, which are secured by a grill and a full metal door. He informs them that if they keep the cells clean, they would have a nice connection. Tim hardly ever sleeps. Day 1. Tim is looking for a seat for breakfast when Dennis offers him a helping hand. Dennis is an older political prisoner serving four life sentences for his anti-apartheid activism. He informs Tim that the convicts in blue uniforms are killers, while those in gray uniforms are political prisoners. They spot Stephen and make a commotion to gain his attention and get him to join them. Dennis inquires about their sentencing. Stephen confidently informs him of their sentence length but they do not intend to serve it. Leonard, a French prisoner, listens in on them. Menier makes an example of potluck after he accidentally spills the soup. Later in the day, when the convicts are exercising in the prison yard, Dennis informs them about the jail's layout, the height of the walls, the searchlight, and the guards, and advises them against attempting to escape. Dennis tells them about the sniper-guarded wall close to the public road. He also tells them that individuals regularly try to sneak in money with the intention of fleeing within a week, but that never happens, and encourages Tim to give him the money for safekeeping before he gets an illness. Leonard approaches the two after Dennis has left, saying that Dennis usually discourages anyone who talks about escape, he believes it is achievable and offers his assistance in exchange. He wishes to be included in their plan. Captain Chenapel observes them and believes they are suspicious. Tim gets the cigar case out of his system on Dennis' advice and, during breakfast under the tables, gives the money to other convicts to Dennis, who puts it in a toothpaste wrapper. Day 23, Tim examines the lock to the grill gate in his cell with a lit match, as if it holds any answers. He stared at the lock for several nights while ideas passed through his head, but nothing stayed. Then. One night, it dawned on him, start with what you know and move backwards. He has a thought. He measures and checks the length of the keyhole using paper. He'd like to carve wooden keys to open the doors. He discusses this notion with Stephen and Leonard in the shower the next day. Leonard dismisses the wooden key concept, but Stephen and Tim are confident it could work. They would obtain the wood from the workshop in order to gain Manier's attention. Leonard causes a commotion in the cafeteria. Tim carefully examines the shape of the key before beginning to draw it in his cell. He examines the key at every chance, whether during training or during their count, until he has a clear draft of it. Day 74, Tim steals sandpaper and wood from the workshop. 
he hides them in his dermos, wrapped in cloth so they don't rattle. As Menir goes through the prisoners' thermoses one by one, Tim's time arrives. Menir notices that he appears stiff. Menir's heart pounds as he taps his thermos on the sink, but he is glad to see nothing odd. Tim works tirelessly on his first prototype that night. His first key is finished after some chiseling. Tim gives it a shot, and the gears turn and the grill door opens like a knife through butter. However, there is one minor issue. The all-metal door has no keyhole from within the cell. Tim informs Leonard and Stephen that they must now create another key as well as a method to open the door from the inside. Leonard is completely on board after achieving success with the first key. Tim observes the shape of the all-metal door key at every chance and eventually makes another wooden variant. Day 100, when there are no guards around and Leonard is sweeping the corridor. Tim tries out the key, he chisels it a little because it's not as smooth as the first one and successfully locks the door. This has made the trio very happy, however, there is one minor issue, he is unable to reopen the door and even breaks the key, leaving a fragment inside. A guard is approaching, as Leonard indicates, in the midst of a tense circumstance. Tim only gets a portion of the puzzle out before the large guard comes. One catastrophe was averted but he couldn't get the lock back in. When it's time for the lock in, Menir notices the lock hanging out but ignores it and locks the door. Much to Tim's relief, it's time for the annual family prison visit. Leonard's kid pays him a visit. As a result of a motion, Leonard touches the glass, and Menir uses this as an opportunity to conclude the half-hour meeting. His son had given him a handcrafted kite. Leonard is quite irritated by this. Day 142, because the key works. Stephen, Tim, and Leonard are now debating how to open the lock from their cells. Leonard recommends using the string from his son's kite to get the key out of the barred window, but they can't turn it. When Leonard picks up the broom to sweep, Stephen notices it and has an idea. They measure the broom's length to see if it can reach the lock from the inside. It's only just long enough. Tim is working in the workshop and is watching a turning machine. In his cell, he successfully constructs a comparable concept system that he attaches to the broom, and puts it to the test that night with a key attached. He is successful in opening the door from the inside, but not without hiccups, as the key falls to the floor when he takes it out. He doesn't give up and sticks it back on the broom with a piece of chewing gum, barely managing to pull it in. Tim is overjoyed the next morning when he informs Stephen and Leonard that despite not sleeping a wink the night before, he managed to unlock the all-metal door. To alleviate the tension of being caught while gardening, they bury wooden keys in a jar. Menir spots them together, approaches Tim, and inquires as to what they were doing, believing anything is wrong. Tim soon clarifies that Stephen was simply picking up his garden debris. Menir instructs him to clean up his own messes. Dennis tells Tim to be cautious and advises him not to try to flee, but adds he will keep an eye out for them. Tim gets out of his cell one night and examines the stairway. He advises the others that if they can open one door, they can open all the other doors and escape from the prison. Day 206. Nothing remains the same in prison, but nothing changes. The routine remains the same, and you seek out flaws to exploit in order to make the most of it. Tim has become acquainted with potluck. Through the window, he requests that he obtain the road map and other items required for their escape. Potluck alerts Manir to the arrival of the goodies during breakfast. Tim gets newspapers in exchange for some soap and cigarettes by the dumpsters. Day 296. Manir visits Tim's cell to deliver his new glasses, which he had ordered and to inform him that Potluck has been arrested for smuggling. Tim is even more motivated to flee since he recalls his wife encouraging him to stay strong. That night, he and Leonard build dummies on their mattresses and escape from the cell. They take their time descending the steps and approaching the next grilled fence to test the keys. The admin room is just around the corner. They are aware that the huge guard is working the night shift so they are informed well in advance of his arrival. They're still sweating profusely, but one of the keys to this gate works. The large guard turns off his music and begins on the night patrol. Tim and Leonard hide in a closet, barely keeping the door shut. As the huge guard slowly walks up the stairs, they sneak out and through the admin area, trying their keys on the next doors, which they successfully open. Stephen coughs to indicate that the guard has completed his patrol and will return soon. As the guard descends the stairs, 
They just manage to lock the door and hide in the closet. The huge guard observes the sweat on his way back but doesn't think much of it. The two go back to their cells. Tim is excessively enthusiastic and hides critical parts in a cup. Captain Schnappel and other guards entered Tim's cell that morning. He slept right through the alarm. Schnappel asks Tim if he is sick, hinting that he is interested as to why Tim overslept. Schnappel's 20 years of experience tells him that he overslept because Tim is exhausted, and Tim is exhausted because he does not sleep at night. But Tim can only apologize. He is dispatched, and everyone's cells are searched for clues. Tim is summoned, and the cup containing his toothbrush falls over, spilling the key bits. Captain Schnappel picks one up and inquires as to its nature. Tim barely keeps his cool and soon comes up with the idea of making them hold up his parents' picture. Schnappel is convinced Tim is hiding something and vows to find out what it is. It was a nail biter. Tim gets a panic attack the next night because his nerves give out, but he perseveres. He describes how the barriers offered a fresh perspective on things, so that the entire prison became their hiding spot. They snuck out for several nights and started manufacturing fresh keys for their escape. They begin to make other plans for their escape, including obtaining civilian clothing from the laundry. Day 404, Tim gets a tooth infection, and the nurse tells him he needs to go to the clinic. Tim discovers, while being escorted by Manier, that there is a button to press to open the automatic door. He also notices the construction of a new guard tower. It's Christmas Eve, and they've finished all of their preparations. Tim, Stephen, and Leonard propose their strategy to Dennis and the other inmates. They've manufactured 39 keys for 15 different doors. Dennis and the others contend that even if they escape, they will have nowhere to go. The group is unable to persuade anyone to join them in their escape. Dennis returns Tim's money, disguised as eucalyptus toothpaste. Manier notices the toothpaste on Tim's bed and believes it is a precaution for his dental problem. Captain Schnappel, suspicious that something is going on, turns everything in Tim's cell upside down in frustration, but discovers nothing. After all of the officers have left for the evening, Tim, Stephen, and Leonard begin carrying out their plan. Tim invites Dennis to join them one last time, but he declines. They collect the keys, which are hidden throughout the prison, and change into civilian clothes. The large guard clogs the toilet and goes to the closet to retrieve the plunger. He finds a twisted paper clip Leonard used to keep the closet door closed, but dismisses it. The three make their way down the stairs and hide in the closet when they hear footsteps, but they do not find the paper clip. They have no idea that the large guard is on his way to the closet to replace the plunger. Dennis breaks a light bulb in his cell just in time, producing a short circuit. He shouts at the guard, distracting him. The trio is saved by a hair's breadth and is able to continue their getaway. They gather all of the necessary keys and rush through the doors as swiftly as possible. Leonard returns before they reach the final door and successfully opens the automatic door. Everything goes swimmingly. The gate is wide open, and they can see the street, which is lovely. They embrace and make an attempt to open the final door. That's when they realize none of their keys are working. Their dreams are wrecked in an instant, and Tim declares they must return. They are unable to return. Leonard discovers that the door frame is constructed of wood and attempts to force the door open with a screwdriver and a chisel. Tim is concerned because he is loud, but Leonard is unfazed. He cracks it open, and they creep past the sniper. They march confidently out of the gate, avoiding suspicion. They hail a taxi to drive them out of Pretoria and laugh wildly, unable to believe they have made it. The following morning, Menier discovers that Tim, Stephen, and Leonard have vanished. He sounds the alarm, stunned and enraged, and all the convicts laugh. Tim, Stephen, and Leonard travel to London through Mozambique and Tanzania, where they oppose apartheid. Dennis was published five years later, in 1985. Please subscribe, to assist the channel, turn on notification and leave a like. Thank you for taking the time to watch. See you again soon.